Welcome everyone to our Wednesday 2 p.m. roundtable. Um, I trust everyone's families and friends are safe. I think everyone knows by this um, time that we've published the Producers Guild COVID safety protocols for producers of independent productions. And if you haven't had a chance to look at them, I'm sure Ms. Michelle will throw up a link um, to look at them. Just to remind everyone, these are documents for producers working in non-studio environments to use as a guideline for safely planning your productions. Um, we have a we have a lots of great guests today, and um, I'd like to start by saying what we have what we have are our task force that I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a minute. We have um, two producers from a production that was shut down and restarted, so I'm sure we'll get a lot of great information from them. Um, we have a representative from film finances and also someone from the entertainment industry. So, I mean, from the insurance industry um, for independent production. So I'm sure we'll be asking them a lot of questions. So um, first, I'd like to start by just having our task force introduce themselves. And we have a couple um, updates from a few of them. So let's start with Gary Lucchese. Go. Oh, well, I'm Gary Lucchese, President Emeritus of the Producers Guild with Laurie McCreary. We were presidents from 2014 to 2018. Um, I was a member of the task force that worked on this program and I'm gonna be happy to introduce to you Paul Jones today uh, from Hub Insurance. And I've known Paul for 20 years. He was president of Albert G. Rubin and Aon. So he's uh, as, as sophisticated and as knowledgeable as any insurance person around. So I look forward to uh, him speaking and the questions you may have for him. And just so you know, if you're um, listening right now or watching, please feel free to throw some questions into the Q&A on any of the topics that, um, that I just laid out. Uh, Jen Hare. Hi guys, uh, Jen Hare. I'm a line producer in DGA UPM. Been working with the Producers Guild. It's about 2013 on uh, production safety initiatives, so. Thank you. Uh, Diana White. Hey everyone, I'm Diana White. I am the manager of member services and events for the Producers Guild based in New York. Thanks, Diana. Michelle Bird. Michelle Bird, Associate National Executive Director, Producers Guild. And, and, and manager of everything behind the scenes and getting the entire uh, COVID safety protocols up at like, I don't know, two minutes before they went live. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Harvey Wilson. Hi, Harvey Wilson. I'm a former board member and a nonfiction EIC and line producer. Um, and uh, I've been working with this wonderful group of people, intelligent, smart, uh, experienced, educated people. It's been a pleasure. Um, and uh, I'm also the head of the task force for health insurance benefits for the guild. So any questions for that, you can send to me as well. Great, Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Scher. I'm a film and TV producer. Um, I'm also a former board member many years back. And uh, I, I got asked to join this because I had the uh, distinction of producing the film Contagion. Yes, and scared us at the very first meeting. It was very scary to hear from Stacy. <laughs> um, Chris. Hi everybody, my name is Chris Tomes. I am a former chair of the New Media Council and uh, I currently serve as head of creative services for Walt Disney Television Studios. Great, and Lulu? Hi, I'm Lulu Zaitsa. I'm production operations manager at Amazon Studios and I'm in charge of our COVID protocols and restart plan and um, I started June 1st, just <laughs> to dive right in. <laughs> right, that's going right in the deep end. Yes. Uh, Lulu's gonna talk to us a little bit um, today about uh, the testing protocols and the pros and cons, things that have worked and not worked. So I'm gonna start with you after we finish the introductions, Lulu. Yeah. And Bob. You're muted, Bob. Sorry about that, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Salerno. And independent producer uh, based in New York, but uh, uh, was in Los Angeles uh, for 10 years before that. Um, and I've been working with the uh, PGA, PGA Safety Task Force this period of uh, uh, coming up with some of these protocols and research. I've also worked a bit with Film Finances on a uh, committee with them, uh, helping 
just figure out how to how to get things going again. Fantastic. Thanks, Bob. So um, let's start, Gary. Why don't you um, do your formal introduction to Paul, then we'll introduce Steve and the team from the production that was shut down and brought back. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Paul Jones. Uh, you know, Albert G. Rubin for years was the, was the insurance company that represented all of the major studios. And I met Paul years and years ago when I was at Paramount. And, and then I, I believe Aon purchased, I bought out Albert G. Rubin. Isn't that right, Paul? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so then Paul became a big executive for Albert G. Rubin, and and um, he's also an, an excellent golfer. And we met on the golf course, and we would walk and play golf. And he would, I would question him about the insurance business, and he had always had all the answers. And lately, he's he's moved on uh, to uh, working for Hub International as and runs the entertainment sector, and and uh, he is as knowledgeable as it comes when it comes to insurance, and um, uh, understands and. Uh, sees where the state of the art is and and the problems that are ensuing and where we might be finding some solutions. So um, I'm really happy to that he's a part of this today because I'm going to be learning as much as all of you from him. Well, thanks for uh, having me on, Gary. I appreciate it. And I wish there was a a sure sure answer uh, to all this COVID stuff and uh, as far as coverage goes. But, um, you know, it's right now, uh, I can honestly say that there's, there's some unrealistic solutions that we've been able to put together um, that nobody has, has bought. Uh, they're too expensive. <laughs> um, the deductible's too high. The coverage is limited. Um, and as of now, that's really the only solution that is out there for independent productions. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, we quoted a $20 million movie uh, not too long ago. The uh, only insurer out there that was willing to write it was um, for COVID was Berkshire Hathaway. The rate was 10% of the budget, so that's a $2 million premium. The deductible was 10%, $2 million, deduct, $2, $2 million premium, $2 million deductible, and I believe the limit was $5 million. So needless to say, the production company did not buy the coverage. So, um, you know, as far as independent production goes, there, nobody is really writing the co coverage that it includes COVID. So the only productions that you, you will uh, be able to get some sort of coverage um, are from the studios. They do have coverage under their programs, although they do have very high deductibles. So they're self-insuring a major part of the COVID risk. So, you know, for those of you doing studio shows, I think you're seeing that, you know, the studios are going to want a lot of loss control people on set. They're going to want them to start uh, in pre-production and be on set all the way through wrap. They're going to want you to follow all these procedures um, because at the end of the day, if something happens, um, it's going to be, you know, the studio's money that's going to pay for those losses. So it's not, uh, it's not a pretty picture out there. I'm sure you all know that. Um, and I wish I had solutions, but right now with the way that testing is going, the way that the virus is spread, it, the risk is just not quantifiable for them. They can't control it. Um, they're not gonna put people on your set and ensure the risk. So the studios are the ones that are basically doing that right now. Okay, on that high note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had better news. I wish I could ensure. Yeah. I think just to, just to give some, because um, we do independent production as well, and we're looking outside of America right now. So we're currently um, hoping to go into production on an Italian uh, UK co-production that is looking like we might be able to tag into their to their government the uk's government backed um insurance so but it's it's all in process so we've heard that canada has some 
um, provisions for that and the UK. So not all is lost, although we might be losing some productions to, um, you know, outside of America for the near future. Thanks. Yeah, there's, there is a, um, a captive by a uh, um, insurance broker in Canada, and they are offering some coverage for COVID, but again, the terms are really, really ridiculous. And the, the paper behind the insurance is not very strong. So, um, you know, it's not really a, a very good solution. Yeah, we were, we looked into, I forgot the company in Canada, but it was something like 100,000 per million of coverage with a lot of restrictions. So it ends up being almost for a small, you know, less than $10 million budget movie, it ends up being pretty untenable. Someone's asking if there's a scenario where the federal government will step in and help with these. We're, we're, we're hoping that that happens, but it is basically in DC right now. And it's, it's, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a bit of a sticky issue because you don't want all employers to get out of the liability if they put their um, employees in harm's way. And so there's, it's hard, you know, you have to distinguish the entertainment industry out as separate from kind of typical employers. And it's a, it's more of an educational process for all of us to get the um, legislature, legislative bodies in DC to understand why it's different. Um, because if you don't understand our business, it seems like it's, it's the same thing. So, but we're all trying and everyone's out there, you know, working as hard as they can to get people in Washington to back us. I do want to mention one other thing that uh, we're noticing that some of these in, the insurance companies are misbehaving a little bit, especially if you had placed a policy prior to the start of, of the uh, pandemic. So if you had placed a policy in pre-production um, in February and you're planning to go into production in April or May or somewhere down the line. We've seen that some of the insurance companies are sending out letters stating that their policy now includes a pandemic exclusion or a COVID exclusion. That's just not, uh, that's not, not right. If you purchased a policy before and it did not have a COVID or pandemic exclusion, they can't add an exclusion after the fact. So just something to look out for. Copy, copy. We have a couple questions. Um, uh, someone's saying media services will cover COVID as a workers comp claim. Um, we had that conversation last week where in, at least in California, if somebody contracts uh, COVID while they're working on a production, it's assumed that uh, it's got it, gotten at work. So workers comp um, presumably will cover it. Um, That's special to California, though. Yes, only California right now. As we're looking into the other states to find out. Thank you, Lulu, for, for clarifying that. We're looking into other states to find out. Um, uh, what about COVID insurance for low-budget indie to shoot in LA? In Italy, that's the situation I was in. We, we went down four or five rabbit holes thinking there was uh, insurance to cover COVID in Italy. We haven't yet found it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We just ended up in doing a co-production with the UK as the way for us to get covered on the Italian piece of the shoot. Um, are there any other countries where independent productions can obtain COVID insurance? Does anyone know any, anyone besides Canada and or the UK? I do not. Yes, uh, there is a program in Australia, um, obviously only for Australian domestic productions. Um, and it, the max capacity they have at any one time is 50 million. So it'll get used up very quickly. Um, so you have to be certified as an Australian production, be ready to go. Um, and then while all that money's tied up because they're on risk basically through photography, they only have 50 million of capacity and it's maxed out. Um, I don't remember the exact percentage of the budget, but it's capped at 4 million uh, uh, Australian dollars, I believe per project, whichever of those amounts is less. So thank you. That's I had, I had also I had also heard that New Zealand was about to uh, offer the same. Great. That's a perfect segue to introduce Steve Berman of Film Finances. He's the executive vice president of production. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Any um, any better news on the uh, bond front? 
unfortunately, no. Paul Paul touched on it, and because that is the way the insurance market is looking at it, that's the same as the bond uh, market is looking at it. So. Uh, for most situations, our bonds at this point are going to have a COVID exclusion in them. Uh, we do have some workarounds on a limited capacity for uh, animated projects or things that are in post-production. So we don't have a, you know, a, a bunch of shooting crew congregating on set. We do have some capabilities there, but it's uh, fairly limited. So for the foreseeable future, until there is a uh, insurance product, a mass uh, a mass marketable insurance product, which is lacking right now, our bonds are going to have this exclusion as well, which we have been able to get more projects going than I would have maybe thought a few months ago, but it is pretty limited and it's very difficult for true independence um, without that insurance. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, Mr. Salerno. So I uh, would like to introduce uh, Bob Graff and Karen Getchell, who um, uh, have been working on a project uh, that Joel Cohen was directing Macbeth. They shot it. Uh, they were shooting, I think, pre-COVID and uh, had to shut down and came back up and and um, and completed photography successfully. And uh, maybe uh, Bob and Karen, if you could just give a little uh, uh, idea of your experience shooting and shutting down and, and starting up and how it went. Hopefully some good news. <laughs> <laughs> They completed it, so that's good there. Uh, Bob, Bob, you're, you're mute. on mute. There we go, sorry about that. Um, yes, it was good news. Uh, we, you know, we didn't, it, it wasn't always clear that it would be good news at the end, but it, it turned out to be, to work out great. Um, yeah, we were, as, as Bob said, we were in production like so many other people, obviously, and shut down on March 13th uh, and you know, kind of went into, you know, hibernation like everyone else until, and, and I, I should start by saying our, the, our show is completely, it's all on stage. So there, our experience in terms of what we did on our protocols and how we kind of ran things is obviously unique to our circumstances. And, um, you know, every show, as everybody here knows, is completely different. And a location-based show would have other things to contend with that we didn't have to do. Um, but we, had, so we were under the, we we're shooting on the Warner Brothers lot. So we had to kind of wait for, to see what Warner Brothers was going to do until, uh, before they were willing to open up and allow even their own employees, let alone outside uh, shows to come in because we're not a Warner show, we're just a tenant. So, you know, we went into hibernation. We started thinking about it. Obviously everything became, you know, started to, to as, as things started to ramp up and we got some indication from Warner Brothers that they were going to reopen the lot, we had to kind of kick it into high gear to, you know, get our protocols in order and get our waivers from the unions and guilds in time to, to be ready to shoot because we were about to lose cast members. We had, I had three cast members in the UK that we had to get in to the country and those, and I, one, of them, one of which I was gonna to lose to a show in uh, New Zealand for a year. So, you know, and they had obviously, they were like number four on the call sheet that had been established. So um, we were able to get them in and, and um, you know, and get back into production. But we, you know, when we started, and Karen can jump in whenever she wants, but when we started, it, it was pretty early. You know, we were probably one of the first you know, there was there were shows that were coming back. I think the prom started right around the same time we did. They had about four days of reshoots or, or additional photography to do. Um, but we were certainly among the earliest, you know, shows of any size to come back and, and finish. And I think, um, you know, we were an independent show. I mean, A24 was the studio, but it's, it's you know, they're, you know, they don't quite have the same robust health and safety uh, infrastructure that the studios do. So we had to kind of make up our own protocols, which, you know, Karen and I wrote them ourselves uh, in conjunction with our, with a, a, a you know, a safety uh, consultant that, that had been on the show previously, as well as a infectious disease uh, advisor that, that uh, we and a 24 contracted. Um, but it was, it, well, Karen, leap in whenever you whenever you like. But we had um, we had about three weeks to shoot when we came uh, when we came back, and 
you know, it, it, the, the one thing I think that, that we had to contend with at the time, it was this early August, it was very, you know, it was a time of very high stress. And so you're, in addition to kind of trying to construct uh, protocols that are making people safe and that are allowing us to get our work done, you're really also trying to address everyone's anxiety. I mean, the crew is wound up in a high state. You know, a lot of people, you know, hadn't been out of their house much at all at that point. Um, I think people, I'd be interested in, in hearing if anybody's had any experiences more recently, because I think people are sort of, you know, as more and more shows are coming back and more and more things are reopening, people are starting to get a little more accustomed to kind of just dealing with wearing the masks and, you know, handling it. For us, it was certainly for me and for a lot of the crew, you know, the first time we had to be on set, that's certainly the first time I had to wear a mask for 10 hours in a row. And it's, it's a fatiguing, stressful experience, you know, and it's, it, you're, you're simultaneously trying to do all the jobs that everybody does so well and then pay attention to all the rest of the stuff. And, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, we had about five weeks to prep. Yeah. Which was pretty hairy. I mean, considering the fact that we were writing our own protocols, we were also um, creating a testing protocol with a company that had never done it before. Um, that was really trying. And it's a company called Carbon Health, and they turned out to be really great. But you know, sort of the marriage of uh, production and our accelerated timeline with sort of, you know, a techie San Francisco medical company was kind of an interesting and challenging marriage, certainly at the beginning, um, you know, but pulling it together in five weeks was really rough and stressful. And, you know, as Bob said, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I, our jobs are not without stress anyway. And then you sort of layer in this incredible anxiety that the cast and crew have um, and the responsibility of uh, everybody's, you know, everybody's health. It was, it was, it was rough, but you know, it yeah, all. There, there, were, there, were, there were certainly times when Karen and I looked at each other and we're like, oh my God, you know, we are not, we're not qualified to run a medical facility. Uh. <laughs> That's sometimes not what you feel like you're doing. I mean, our, the, the testing issue was really the, you know, all the, the issues with PPE and, and social distance and whatnot. I mean, you, you have to come up with, obviously, policies that work for your individual project that allow you to maintain, you know, to keep the proper protection, keep the proper distance and figure out how to do your work at the same time. The testing at the time that we were doing it was just fraught. I mean, we went back and forth with several different protocols based on different recommendations after talking to different people, talking to different people, trying to ramp up other productions, you know, and, and as everybody knows, particularly at that time when we were starting, the, the lag time to get a, a, a PCR test back from a laboratory that, that was performing the test what could be quite long. I mean, you know, people were waiting a week, you know, a week and a half to get results sometimes. Our, and our infectious disease consultant was very clear about that, that he felt like for the purpose of, of detecting and controlling an infection within a population like a film crew, that, that frequency of testing and speed of results trumps the, the, the accuracy of, of the individual test every time, in his opinion. And so we relied, you know, we were relying heavily on a rapid testing regimen. And the company that we were working with had, you know, access to the, APID, to the Abbott ID Now test. And so we set up a, a, you know, a mobile lab on the set, on the lot, and we had six Abbott machines, and we just tested... You know, we tested everyone in our zone A, all the cast, all the hair and makeup, all those people, every, you know, people in the immediate performance zone five days a week. Just wow. everybody went through a rotation. They got their swab. They, the test was performed. We get the results back in 15 or 20 minutes. And it, and, and it was, it, it was a, that, that regimen, I think, did, does two things. I mean, it's, it's the frequency allows you to sort of hopefully catch any infection before it becomes, you know, really transmissible. Did you have any positives? 
We had, no, we did not have any confirmed positives. Well, we had a, po we had a positive during our test in. I mean, our, our specific protocol was that you needed two, two negative tests prior to start. And then you went into a rotation based on your proximity to the set. So, you know, zone A and everyone in a sort of performance, you know, a red zone area, whatever you want to call it, was, uh, was five days a week. And then people who were maybe on the set, but not right at camera were three days a week. People off production were two days a week. So we had a, we had a positive during the test in phase and then that person just never started. We had a positive test that came back from our, from one of our Abbott rapid tests um, just before we started shooting. And it was uh, in our, in the sort of stunt pod. And we were able to, conf to subsequently confirm that that was a false positive. We tested, we tested that person again twice immediately with the Abbott test. And then we also took a sample and sent it to the a lab, waited for results. They quarantined in the meantime, and then they were, that came back negative as well. So, and that's obviously the, one of the, you know, the, the hope, I, I mean, I, the, the rapid test, the Abbott rapid test that we use certainly has its drawbacks. It that's has, the PCR, rapid PCR it test. Is a, it is a PCR test. It's a molecular test. Yeah. But it's less accurate than a, than a PCR test that's performed at a laboratory. Yeah. It has a higher propensity to produce false negatives um, and a higher propensity to produce false positives as well. All the, the po false positive rate is still, is still very, very low. But you know, if you're over the course of a show and you're performing, you know, 80 billion tests, you know, I mean, we, we shot for three weeks, we shot, we did what, Karen, 4,500 tests or something over the course of- <laughs> Just over 4,000 tests. Right. So, you know, the, the just, even if the chances are only 0.1% that you're gonna get a, po a false positive, the math is not in your favor and you're, you're probably gonna have one. Did your false positive shut you down at all or stop no, you from any work? No. No, it didn't, fortunately. I mean, it, it forced us to quarantine. We quarantined a, a, a group of people that had close contacts with that person for a few days until we were able to confirm that it was a false positive. You inadvertently followed the PGA protocols for red light. <laughs> right. But this is the, but, but it's, it's exactly, I mean, you know, we're all trying to come up with something that's, that, you know, people are sort of stumbling to the same set of reasonable policies, I think. But, but it's, um, the interesting, the, the thing about the Abbott test that is different from a lab-based based PCR test, and this is how it was explained to us by our, our consultants. The Abbott rapid test is a, is a it, it, it's a, uh, if, when you get a positive back from the Abbott, it's a presumptive positive that requires confirmation by a lab test. So it is not considered a diagnosis, in quotes. So what that does is that it's, it gives you the opportunity to, you, so you're gonna confirm that test with further tests. If you get a, a, a positive result back from a lab-based test, then that is considered a diagnosis and per LA County rules, you must automatically go into quarantine and you cannot test out of quarantine. So you are stuck there, um, as well as all the close contacts of that person. So it's- How a, big was your crew? Our, it was, a, you know, we had a hundred and what, we probably, okay. you know, 125, 130 people. When you brought people back, um, Karen or Bob, did you have a plan um, or an agreement with them that if somebody tested positive, um, like what, would there be sick pay? Would there be, or people had to quarantine? Did you have a... We did. We had a sick pay policy. Our, our policy was that we would pay up to two weeks of sick pay. If you if if you were, I mean, if you were truly sick, or if you just reported being sick, because we wanted people to report symptoms, you know, self-report symptoms. You're you know you're looking for people to be honest and transparent about how they feel. So even yeah. if someone said, I have you know I woke up with a you know a low fever or whatever, I'm going to stay home today. We would pay them for that day. And the same thing with close contacts, if they were forced to um, quarantine and not be permitted to come back to work, then we would pay up to two weeks. So we did have that policy in place. And I, you know, that's, um, I know there's a lot of debate about that in the industry about whether, whether and to what degree that is supportable. It sort of felt at the time to us, like we had to make that choice in order to be able to move forward. 
Yeah, especially um, as the first ones. Did you, um, you had a nurse or a health practitioner um, doing the collections? Well, our medical company did the collections. So they, okay. they would provide trained medical personnel um, that would take the samples and then there were technicians that were running the machines. We also had, I mean, we had an HSS who was a, a, a separate person who was also an RN and, and a public health nurse. So, you know, we also did all the other things. We did temperature checks, we did check-ins, we had, you know, health questionnaires, you know, all the rest of that. But I think, you know, at the root of it is really the testing regimen was the, 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 the real thing. Now we had to actually, even though we were relying on the, on the rapid testing, at the time that we went to get our, our um, waivers, you know, the SAG specifically was not accepting the Abbott test as a valid, th that regimen as a valid method. I, th I think I, I haven't had to check back in with them, but it's, I think that that, I think the attitude is slowly changing, at least uh, that there is a, 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 a beginning to be, a, um, I think a movement um, among, the, you can see it in the press, there's been a lot of studies that have come out that have talked about the benefits of rapid testing and even though the individual tests are less accurate than the, than the other type of tests. So in any case, when we went to get our, our waiver from SAG, they required us um, to, to figure out how to abide by their, their other protocol, which, in, which required a lab-based PCR test. Um, so we ended up doing both. You know, we, we still felt like the rapid testing was the thing that allowed us to maintain as much of the flexibility that a film production requires and also provide the, the sort of safety and constant surveillance of the, of the crew that we felt was important. Um, but in order to satisfy the SAG requirement, we just layered on, th we layered on three more PCR tests that we took samples and sent to a lab. Uh, and we did that for all of our zone A uh, when they were on, so. And those tests were, those tests were, aside from the one time that we had the false positive, those tests were always in agreement. So. And you guys, was it Carbon Health that you said you were using? Carbon Health, yeah. And again, as Karen said, they, you know, they operate a network of clinics like urgent care clinics. They have kind of stepped into, you know, this new industry that has popped up uh, in the last few months. And, and I think, you know, and they're doing a number of other shows. I think they're doing the morning show for Apple. Um, I forget what else, Karen, who else they were going on to do, but. Oh, for, let's add Lulu to the conversation yeah. since you've had a lot of testing, uh, testing, uh, experience. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Lulu. Well, I, I want to, first of all, uh, commend Bob and Karen for coming up with their protocol on their own. Um, our protocol is extremely similar to yours. We are the only studio testing group A every day. Um, we are testing the others more, less frequently, but are, we probably have a large group A because we can afford to have a large group A. We are also uh, pushing very hard the Abbott ID Now tests because being able to have the result right away is far more important. And the only, the only place uh, we differ, and this is partly due to the CDC announcement that came out August 3rd, right when you guys were starting just to completely confuse us all about if you've had a positive. We're not calling anything a false positive. A person is positive. I mean, the test has read that there's virus there. The question is, is it a contagious live infection positive or is it a residue of having had COVID in the past? And since at least 40% of the people with COVID have no idea they've ever had it. We are highly likely on our productions to have these positives that if you test again, will be negative because they've sneezed, they've coughed, they've got residual infection left in their body. And so we've, we have updated our protocol to respond to that specific situation and do follow-up tests if an Abbott has a positive. But we're trying to take the, the 
lingo, false positive out of the dialogue because it causes the crew to mistrust the tests. No, I think that's a good point. I think that is a good point because it is, it's, it's a, you're right. It is, um, it's a term that, that, that causes people to lose faith in the process. And, and I think, I mean, that also goes along with, I, you know, when we, it was actually very interesting because when we had that person, when we had that positive result come back from the Abbott and then we confirmed that it was negative, or, you know, that it was subsequently negative, we, we went into, it, it caused us to really think very, very hard and clearly about what our, our policy and protocol would be if there were in fact a, a confirmed positive that we, you know, that, and what we would do in terms of notifying the crew and how we would notify the crew and whatnot. And I, you know, it's, it, it goes without saying that you have to come up with these policies, but it was, it made it all very immediately real. And it, we were fortunate that at the time that that happened, it, our, our consultant, our infectious disease consultant was with us on the set because we were about to start shooting. And so we were able to sort of huddle up and we came up with a, you know, a, a plan for how to, you know, who gets the, you know, cause you have to be very clear about who gets the information, you know, who is, you know, for all the, all the privacy rules and, and everything else. It's like, okay, the test results come in. They come into, in our case, they came into our testing coordinator. We had a testing coordinator who was running our, our, you know, crew appointments and running that whole system. And so they were sitting at this sort of dashboard of the, of the, you know, the, the results dashboard. So they got it and then the HSS would get it. And then Karen would also be included in the, in the specifics of who, who and how they tested. Then we had a plan, depending on whether the, the positive result came from an Abbott or came from one of our lab tests, there was a different set of procedures. If it was an Abbott, the person was immediately called back. They were immediately given two more tests. You know, if, if, the, if those are negative, then, then we presume the person is, is, is permitted to go back to work. If, if, the, if they were positive, if either of them were positive, you know, then we send another sample back to, off to the lab. They they go into quarantine. We trace their contacts, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, if it, if the if the positive if the original positive test had come back from a lab test, then that sort of automatically you know home you go and we trace the contacts. But we also we tried to be very clear also with the crew, and we published all this. We put we sent it out to the crew and said this is what we're going to do. Because it, it, it also was a, a process of just trying to let the crew know that we were going to be very transparent and honest about what's happening. Because I think that people have, you know, in the absence of any of, any of that, in the absence of any information, they start to distrust the, the production company as well. They start to like, you know, it's, it's, you want them to know that if there is a positive case, they will be informed, even if they're not necessarily informed of the specifics of who it is or what the, you know, right. and, and yeah. you know details. Can, can, can I ask Lulu a question, Lulu? Can you review again? So if you, so you're doing rap, uh, rapid testing PCR through the Abbott system, and what do you call it if there's a non-negative result? Like, how are you referring to it? Because I think that's important, right? So we're, we're calling all positives positives okay, okay. Um, but we have and our, our protocol was just put to the test just this week and um, we broke our protocol and now we have to update it <laughs> um, but basically we, we decided after the CDC announced that and many consultations thereafter that for at least 90 days after you've had COVID, you will repeatedly test positive. So that just put our whole testing protocol, it's just like, oh my God, you know, they're, don't, they're not sick, but they're gonna keep testing positive. We can't just keep shutting down production. How are we gonna deal with this? And uh, the CDC basically said, you know, there's no point in further testing. We had multiple, we had a lot of conflicting information after that. Oh, yeah. Um, some believe that you can't get COVID again, and some don't believe it. I mean, and I would say that's a 
50-50 split amongst doctors. I mean, we, yeah. So we've fallen on the conservative side that yes, it isn't proven that you can't catch it again, so maybe you can, and we're gonna continue testing. But we changed our protocol. So if we knew that you had had COVID before, because you've had it while you work for us, or we, you know, you come and tell your doctor tells us that you've already had COVID, then if you had a positive result, we would automatically retest you. Now you were still isolated immediately. We still started contact tracing immediately on everyone that you were in contact with because until we've confirmed that it, it's a residue, we don't know. So we had to initiate all of the protocols. But um, if, if then you get two negative tests, then you're free to go back to work and everyone we contact trace are told is false alarm and you can go back to work. This person already had COVID and this is a, a leftover. Um, where we just broke our own rule is uh, a person who was not only group A, but literally if they were positive, they were gonna take out 80% of our group A's for 14 days. Wow. Um, we said, we don't know if they had COVID before or not, but we're definitely putting them through the retesting and confirming because otherwise the production is shut down for two weeks. So if, if that person had been a non-essential person or maybe they were only gonna take out one or two people in quarantine with them, we probably wouldn't have done that. We probably stuck to our protocol. It's their first positive, mm -hmm. they're out. Um, but, you know, we second guessed ourselves because if we sent them out, we were shut down and, and they came back, their subsequent tests have been negative ever since. And so, you know, we're convinced that they had COVID somewhere in the past. Yeah. That's what we, we had, we, your, your new protocol was our, was our old protocol. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, but it's, I, the the new t the the challenge that we've had recently, um, which was an early challenge back in May and June, and why you know a lot of us couldn't even start <clears throat> until late June, is recently we had a shortage of the assays of the samples, and suddenly we couldn't you know we didn't have enough samples to run our tests that we wanted to run. Uh, so one of the things that we are doing is making sure we have multiple vendors lined up. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly if we have a show with larger numbers that you cannot rely on a single vendor because they're all, the supply chain is still erratic. And um, basically Abbott had one of their facilities shut down. And they just, you know, they 50% of their deliverables stopped. Now they're up and running again and okay, we're up and running again, but these things are so sensitive. Another one we had, we were using a lab and we got, it was crazy. They, they told us, you know, we had four positives in one round and huge panic. And then four hours later, the lab calls us, no, 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 no. It's a false alarm. We've had, and this was, this is one of the, you know, send away labs, you know, this is supposed to be the gold standard. And they had had a, they had had contamination within the lab and the FDA came in and shut the lab down. So again, uh, having, a, having backup resources, I think is important. Um, it's funny, I see a question asking about, you know, you're waiting for the results. Are you asking people to quarantine? Are you paying them to do that? Uh, I think it's the reason for the frequency of our tests. We can't ask people to change their lives. We can't ask people to quarantine. Um, we just have to get in a regimen of frequent and regular testing. So the odds of them arriving at the work site can, in a state of contagiousness is reduced. Um, the other reason for frequency of testing is if you have a positive, your look back period to how many people did that person infect is goes back to the last time they had a negative test. 
So, you know, you want that time period to be as short as you can afford it to be. Exactly. And that's, yeah, because at the point where you, you know, if you're waiting 72 hours for these results to come back, they're just almost useless at that point. I mean, in terms of contact tracing a person through a, a, a production on a, on a set, it's, it's just, it's madness, you know? Yeah, especially if, if you're testing once, a, like our group Bs were testing once a week. So if that result is 72 hours, your look back period is now 10 yeah, days. 10 days. Right. And yeah. then how do you do that? Do you have a protocol for contact tracing, I'm assuming? That's... Yeah, um, the, the first thing we do is identify people who are in the same physical spaces. That's a very quick, and that's a very big number. Um, and then we, if, if we have contact tracing app in place, which is literally happening right now, we'll be able to look at the app and know who are actually within six feet of each other and how long. But in the meantime, and for most of us, um, it's about interviewing those people and it, it's difficult. The other crazy thing is the person who tests positive, they have to isolate which is stricter than quarantine for 10 days. But the person that they have put at risk, they're out in quarantine for 14 days. So oh, try and explain wow. to the crew member who's not sick that they're gonna miss more work is- um, It's the, it's, and it's supposedly it's because you're, if you're, if you're sick, if you've tested positive, you've gone through a four day incubation period. And so you've yeah. had a head start wow. on your quarantine and that's the reason why it's different. But yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, <laughs> Do you have an app that you're using Lulu or that you guys are looking at? Yeah, we're, um, we're just launching it. We just started it this week on our first show. Uh, it's called Certify Snap XT. And it sort of combines, you know, it combines the questionnaire. They have thermal scanners and then they also have contact tracing and you can do contact tracing using a phone app or you can use contact tracing using Bluetooth devices. So we're issuing a, com a different, an array of Bluetooth devices. Some are like stickers that go on to your ID badge. Um, others are bracelets that will vibrate if you're within six feet of another one. Um, so those are great. good for the crew. You know, we don't, we're not putting those on the group A's, but it's more about the other crew who are kind of a little mm -hmm. too casual because they're out do, of they, sight. Do, they, do they collect your location data or is it just sort of, is what it, they and, do, they had a blowback from crew about that? Well, because it's only collecting data, what, what this app does is it records the device ID that's too close to you. Okay. And when it's too close to you. So you've only got a record of device IDs. Then um, if Joey tests positive, we look up Joey's device ID and we run the contact logs for that device against the other devices. So there's no people and it's not where, it just says these two devices were hanging out together for 20 minutes on this day. And so it's also only between devices registered on the show, you know, it's not registering anyone else. And so then when we get a list of the devices that meet the criteria for a close contact, we look up those names. So it's, it's, it's quite, um, you know, we're really not capturing private information. We had, you know, we had, I mean, it's, it's interesting because we sort of discussed those kinds of issues and we, and partially because we had a, a relatively short period of time to come back mm -hmm. and finish it, it's, it wasn't worth setting up a, you know, a system like that, but it is, it's, in, now that more and more of those things have come up, it's sort of an intriguing solution to the problem because, you know, what we did is we, you know, we established a sort of, you know, uh, we had a whole pod system thing in addition to zone A and zone B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the whole pod thing is, of course, very fraught and doesn't really, it's, it's a very odd, um, you know, there's the people that constantly want to argue with you about what pod you, you think they're in or not in or whatever. And it doesn't, it's, 
in our mind, at least in my mind, the pod, the, the, the sort of pod system was not necessarily so much about um, maintaining strict separation between groups of people because it's inevitable that people are going to have to be, you know, working together on certain, uh, you know, at, uh, at certain points. But the pod, putting, putting a pod system in place, I think, at least gives you some it gives you a slight head start. It's like your proximity test first, if you do have a positive test that you're, it gives you some, the first place that you're going to look for close contacts is within that pod. Yeah. And then secondly, I think it, it has, it, it, for me, one of the biggest benefits or one may, I don't know, I don't know how big, but one of the benefits was just sort of uh, the psychological effect that it has on people. It, it, I, at least I hope that it made people, more aware and deliberate about their interactions with other crew members, particularly across pod boundaries, even if they, even if they had to occur, you know, you might have a, a, the grips in one pod and the electricians in another pod. And of course they're still going to sometimes be working in proximity, but, but it, it puts it a little more front of mind, I think. And so much of, so much of the behavior of the crew and like how you get through all these things, is you know you have to kind of keep people's vigilance up because you know we found even over the course of our three-week shoot that you know the first week everybody's freaked out because they're just they've come out of their cave they've got their mm -hmm. masks on they don't know what to you know they're trying to figure out how to do their jobs the second week things kind of settled into a routine and and they were like okay i feel like i got this this is you know i i I, I, it's it's gonna it's working in in a way for people. And the third week, people are starting to get complacent, and they're getting too close to each other. They're feeling a little casual. They feel like they're in a bubble because everybody's being tested all the time. And but they forget that the you know the testing, the testing doesn't necessarily keep people from getting sick. It tells you if you have a problem. Right. But it's not it's not protective. You know, the, the protective things are the distance and the PPE and all the rest of that. And so you have to kind of convince people to behave as, as, as if people might be positive, even though they're testing negative all the time. I think and, that's a good question if I could ask hard. Lulu, because Lulu, are you restricting or did any of you guys restrict people, for example, in zone A from traveling on weekends or days off or having visitors on days off? What was the protocol for like outside contact? Um, this is a huge problem, a huge problem. And um, we've only had, knock on wood, we've had many positive tests. We've had positive tests on every single production. Wow. Okay, so we have over 30 productions, all 30 have had positive tests. Um, and I mean, real positives where the person had to isolate and we had to contact trace and everything else. Um, We've only had one group A mid-production, no, sorry, we've had two. We've had only two group A mid-production come in and test positive and completely related to social life over the weekend. Mm. I mean, like 100%. Mm. One was a dancer who went clubbing, like, <laughs> Um, and the other, you know, she was number three on the call sheet, but she missed her boyfriend and she snuck off and went home. Uh. Um, so you can't, I mean that, and like Bob said, the testing is to prevent the damage that will occur if they come back and are contagious, right? It, yeah. The testing has no preventative benefit <laughs> whatsoever. Right. Um, it just catches it earlier. And with the girl who went to see her boyfriend, she only one other person had to quarantine, thank God. Um, with the one who went clubbing, she infected 10 people. Oh. Oh. In, yeah. in one rehearsal, in a single rehearsal. Yeah. Wow. That's we, we you know, and like, you know, we would, we tried to, um, you know, there isn't really very much I, I, we felt that we could do in terms of controlling people's behavior on their off hours or on the weekends, other than to just appeal to their, 
you know, better judgment. So we would send out on, on Fridays, we would send out an email to the crew that was just, you know, a, we had a sort of risk assessment chart that we would include. We send, we send that out along with an email that's just like reminding everyone, you know, let's please try to, you know, be safe on the weekend, avoid large gathering, blah, 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 blah. You know, just again, as a, to nag people. And we have obviously had the benefit of not having a very long production. And so, you know, people were kind of maybe, and, and we had a, I think, a you know, a sort of relatively mature crew and, uh, and cast that, you know, was not prone to clubbing. So. <laughs> now we have one line producer on one of our shows uh, and they're on location. And so they're worried, but they're on a driving distance. Like people could drive home on the weekend if they wanted. So they shifted their shooting week to Wednesday to Sunday. That's interesting. That's smart. <laughs> because they just wanted to deter that desire to go home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I did, we just finished a production. It wasn't my production, but my business partner was in it and they did night shooting. So the cast was, you know, sleeping during the day and right. shooting at night and they had a, an off weekend week. You know, they, they worked on the weekends and I was like, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's, let's give them time off on Monday morning. Exactly, perfect <laughs> idea. Hey, you guys, it's three o'clock. So I wanna be mindful of everyone's time, especially all of you who are on the panel here. I just wanna blow through a couple questions. Antibody testing, no one's using antibody testing, right? And until somebody tells us that's gonna be helpful to us, even, antibody testing before getting a PCR positive doesn't help us. So I think that's off the table. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, a couple questions on indie uh, productions where these bigger, uh, the bigger labs or these bigger companies are, are, they're hard to service. If you look at the, at the acknowledgements, I think Melissa Friedman asked this, uh, Melissa, at the, on the acknowledgements on the Producers Guild, there's a um, a doctor called Dr. Grummer, and he is doing kind of these small indie, if you need 10 tests or less, he's being really great. He's out of LA. You can check that out. Also SAG, the SAG website has a whole list of vendors for the independent film um, production side of it and the large film. So you can find vendors there. The PGA also has something called productiontips.org. And, um, and if you go there and you have either tips to give or you want to call through there and look at what people are doing, it's a really great place for us to um, gather all this information and share it with each other. Because I think that's, that's the most important thing that we can do right now is share the things like Lulu and Bob and Karen have learned and make sure that you know, we're making them safer and safer as we go along. Because I think the more that we do of these productions, the more questions um, we're going to help answer. Uh, thank you, Bob, Karen, Lulu, especially with the real life examples um, that are going on right now. Chris, I'm so sorry we didn't get to you. Can you come next week? 100%. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. And, um, and Bob, thanks for bringing everyone on. Paul, um, thank you so much for your not so great news about insurance, but we appreciate you being here. We're going to ask you to come back as soon as you have different news. And, um, and Steve, thank you as well. We'd love for you to come back as well with some of your colleagues and talk a little bit more about the bond um, company's position once we can start getting independent productions going again. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you next week. Same you. Good seeing you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice to see you, Bob. <laughs>